Okay, this is the second of the Cat and Dog Theology series found in the One Degree Off. This is the second lecture that you're going to be giving as you go through the One Degree Off series of Cat and Dog Theology. And you want to start off reviewing the last time. So our last time, we found out that Christ died not only for our sins, but for all things on earth, all things in heaven, and for the glory of God. And we also said, hey, which one was primary? And we found out that when Jesus talked to his heavenly Father, he spoke about the glory of the Father. The Father's glory was primary. Now listen, when you go and ask people why did Christ die, they'll say for our sins. They're not incorrect, but they're incomplete. And because they don't use the word secondarily, and they just say he died for our sins, they're basically communicating he died only for our sins, and that's where you develop these two different types of theology that we're now calling cat and dog theology. Cat theology says, God lives for me. Dog theology says, I live for God. A cat says, God lives to make me famous. A dog says, I live to make God famous. A cat says, God thinks the world of me. And a dog says, I think the world of God. Both have things that are very scriptural, but it depends upon which one is primary and which one is secondary. And that begins to change how you view your Christianity. So we want to understand why was it about the glory of God. So we're going to look at the glory of God, but we want to start with a very simple passage in Romans chapter 11, verse 36. In Romans chapter 11, verse 36, we read these words. For from him and through him and to him are... Some things. Nope, doesn't say some things. Most things. Nope, doesn't say most things. All things. All things. For from God, everything comes from God, from his power. Everything was created from the power of God. Through him, he upholds all things by the power of his spirit. And to him, everything is designed to point us to God are all things. All things means even the death of his son. So that's what we're trying to say. Even the death of his son, Jesus Christ, death on the cross, was designed to point us to God the Father. It was designed to point us to his glory, not point us to us. So we're asking, why is his glory that important? Why, what is the thing about his glory that makes us want to yell, it's all about the glory of God? Well, in order to understand that, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, we have a picture of four living creatures, very unique living creatures. They have different heads on them. The first is like that of a lion. The second is like an ox. The third is like a man. And the fourth was like an eagle. Now, you would assume if it was all about us, they probably all would have had heads like men or women. But it's not all about us. Therefore, he pulls in animals and different ones. I'm sure all to represent different things. But it helps us to see, no, it's not about us. And so these four living creatures, we read some words that are very interesting. Let me read them to you. It says this, starting in verse 8. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. Day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now, let me ask you a question. These four living creatures around the throne of God, six wings, eyes all around, very weird looking creatures, uh, but they're there 24-7. Let me ask you, do you think they have a free will? Do you think they have a free will? What do you think? Give me some feedback, audience. I let them, some say yes, some say no. Well, let's think through what the two options are, okay? Option number one, let's say they do not have a free will. They do not have a free will. Now, dogs are constantly asking the question, what does God get out of this? A cat says, what do I get out of it? But a dog says, what does God get out of it? So let's think through that dog question. What does God get out of it if the four living creatures do not have a free will? What do you think that says about God? And let your audience respond. They'll say things like, well, he's dictatorial. Well, he's uh, a mean ruler. Well, he's very oppressive. Uh, he has to be in control. And all of those are correct. But then keep driving it a little further. 
Okay, but what does it say about his glory? Specifically, what does it say about his glory? They'll sit there, they're home and all. And finally, someone will say, well, he must not be very that impressive. He must not be that impressive. Yes, that's exactly it. God's glory must not be that great. If they're being forced to do it, they'd probably be saying, you know, I'd rather be off golfing, or I'd rather be out shopping, or I'd rather be playing video games, or I'd rather be watching a movie, but I'm stuck here worshiping God 24-7. Oh, so if they don't have a free will, it doesn't make God's glory look very good because they'd rather be doing something else. And God's will is not that very captivating. Okay, let's look at the other option. What if they do have a free will? Hmm, if they do have a free will, what does that say about God? What does it say about his glory? And they'll usually pop right. It means his glory is amazing. It's awesome. Yes, that's exactly it. God's glory is amazing. God's glory is awesome. In fact, God's glory is so incredible, they never want to leave his presence. And that's what we need to learn about the glory of God. God's glory is so amazing, so great, so incomprehensible, so absolutely awesome. We never want to leave. It satisfies us emotionally so much that nothing else matters. Nothing else is even worthy to be considered. And so we want to be in God's presence 24-7. That is what the glory of God is all about. Now, let me ask you a second question about these four living creatures. It says they are living creatures. Do you think they have... I don't know, blood running through their wings and like our, our arms have blood running through them. What do you think? Most people say yes. Yeah, I think so too. Now, does it, does it tell you in the text that they stop for tea breaks or coffee breaks? Do they stop for breakfast or for lunch or for dinner? No, 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 no. What does that tell you about the glory of God? And then they get it. Oh, it even meets our physical needs. Yes, that's exactly it. The glory of God satisfies us not only emotionally, but physically. That's why Moses could be on top of the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, no food, no drink, no water, and come down radiating. Why? The glory of God satisfies like nothing else. Why do we point to God's glory? Why do we want to get other people to see God's glory? Because God's glory is the only thing that satisfies both physically and emotionally and is going to satisfy us forever. Forever. It's going to be satisfying to us. So, oh, men and women, realize you need to be having those quiet times. You need to be meeting with God. You need to be getting in His presence and soaking in His glory as whatever way you can to be satisfied not only emotionally but physically that it'll bring a calm peace to your bodies don't neglect your quiet times and so one of the reasons we realize that christ died for the glory of god is that it's the only thing that satisfies both physically both emotionally and therefore he wants us to keep seeking him and seeking his face and to be in his presence because his glory satisfies us tremendously. Okay, so we've talked about that and what we've learned about the four living creatures. Now let's go to another passage. It's in the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. God, as speaking to his people through the prophet Jeremiah, says, look, you guys, I've got two major things against you. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, we read these words. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have dug out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Okay, what is, let's first off understand this. He says that two, two, two sins, two things, two problems God has. Number one, you've forsaken me, the spring of living water. And then secondly, You've dug for yourself cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now, what's a cistern? Okay, a cistern 
is something that's a well, basically. It holds water. Back in those days, they dug holes in the ground to hold runoff water so that they could have water to drink. They didn't have a faucet and a spigot like we have today. And so they basically dug wells, and they, those were what they got their water from. But there was a problem with this well that they dig, dug. It leaked. Water would seep into the ground, and before you know it, they didn't get to drink all that much, and it was gone, and they had to fill it back up again. So they had to A, dig the well, that was a lot of work, and B, once they dug it, they had to fill it with water, and then once they filled it with water, it leaked, and they had a problem there. And so you see these problems that God says, this is what you're doing. You're digging for yourself your own cisterns, and you're causing those cisterns, they're empty, they're broken, they're leaking, they're not filling up, they're not satisfying. And you've forsaken me, the spring of living water. A spring just flows over. All you've got to do is get down on your knees and drink from it. So drinking from it, getting down on your knees, you're drinking from it versus digging a well, filling it with water, watching it leak, filling it with more water, watching it leak, filling it, and on and on and on. Okay, so God says, I've got these two problems against you. Now, I'm going to break you down into small groups again. And as I break you down into small groups, here's what you're going to discuss. You're going to discuss... What does God want us to learn from the leaky wells? From the fact that he says it's a leaky well, that it leaks. Give examples of things that you're putting inside your cistern that leaks. Things that you're saying, I want this to satisfy me, not God. I don't want to be like the four living creatures. I want something else to satisfy me, so I'm putting this into my cistern that I've dug to satisfy me. And how does it leak? You get four minutes. Boom. Boom. Give them the four minutes. Okay, what kind of answers are they hopefully going to be given? Here's the kind of answers they're going to be given. Whatever you're putting into that cistern, that, at that well that you have dug, leaks. So you get a new cell phone. Wow, I got this new cell phone, man. It is so cool. It is the hottest. It is the latest. It is the greatest. I'm so excited. And so you get the cell phone. And then about six months, a new one comes out. And all of a sudden, you're eyeing that new one. And you're saying, boy, I, I wish I had that one. That takes more, a better picture, more higher resolution. And all of a sudden, you're not satisfied with the cell phone you have. Why? It leaked. It leaked. Maybe you bought a new TV, and that TV, you've got it for half a year, three quarters of a year, maybe even a year, and then all of a sudden, a new television set comes out that's even better. Higher resolution, bigger screen, and all of a sudden, you're a little jealous. Maybe you get a new car. And all of a sudden, you get a ding in it. And I say, oh man, what a letdown. I can't believe that guy bumped me on the highway and I've got a dent in it. And now it's really, it's just not, I don't, I'm not excited about my car as it used to be. And, and there's dirt in it and people come in and there's the floor. It needs, it needs vacuumed out and it's clean. And you're not as excited. Why? It leaked. Maybe it's watching a movie or watching a television show. And so you watch that movie, you watch that television show. Boy, it was fantastic. And you really enjoyed it, but then all of a sudden it's over and I can't wait for the sequel. It leaks. Constantly leaking. Constantly having to put new phones, new TVs, new food, new experiences, new drugs, new this, new that, because they leak. That's the kind of answer that you want to get from them. Okay, once you've gone over that, okay, we're going to break it down into small groups again a second time. We want you to discover this. Here's the question we're going to ask. What is the contrast between the spring of living water and the well? And how does that apply to your life? What is the contrast between the spring of living water and the well? I've mentioned it very briefly, but let's see if you picked up on it. And if you remember it, boom, have them go to their small groups. What is the answer? Here's the answer. God says, I am a spring of living water. What am I supposed to do to a spring? All you do is get down on your knees and drink. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to dig it. You don't have to do anything. You just got to get down and drink, and it will satisfy you, and it's clean, and it's pure. But the well, the well you've got to dig. I've got to work and get more money so I can buy that newer car or that newer television set or that nicer apartment and so you got to work hard to get it. Didn't have to work to get the spring. God's around everywhere. Or uh, it leaks constantly. We just talked about that. It's constantly leaking. And so you're not completely satisfied. 
And in the big picture of things, whatever you put into that well, it's going to be destroyed once the earth is destroyed. And it's not going to last anywhere for any length of period of time in light of eternity, whereas God's glory will. And so all of a sudden you find these two contrasts. God says, you can have me, a spring, or you can dig your own well, but they're going to leak and you won't be satisfied. Those are the answers you're looking for. Okay, now go back to your small groups again. I want you to say, what does the average Kenyan put into his well? What does the average Christian try to get their selves satisfaction from? Go to your small groups, you get four answers. Maybe it's about what's in your own life, but what does the average Kenyan, what's the average Kenyan Christian putting in their leaky well? Four minutes, get their answers. I have no idea what the answers will be. You guys do. Okay. Now, we're going to go back to your small groups. And in our, in our small group, we say that cats and dogs, uh, have, uh, both cats and dogs, there's two types of Christianities. And what we're saying is the cats have rejected the spring of living water. They're the ones who are digging themselves the cisterns, the broken cisterns that cannot hold any water. So we're going to ask you another question in your small groups. In our, in our ministry, the cat and dog theology that we teach, we say that cats have a feel-good theology, a feel-good theology. As a result, they read their Bibles the way we look at the food in our kitchen. We read our Bibles the way we look at our food in our kitchen or the food in our refrigerator. What do you think we mean by that? Okay, go to your small groups and discuss that. You may have to reiterate the question. What's the answer? Well, the answer is that cats choose only verses that make them feel good. It's like they open up a refrigerator, they look in there and they say, I don't want that, I don't want that, oh, I do want that. They take the one thing out that they like and they close the rest. That's how most cats read their Bible. They only read verses that make them feel good. And as a result, they've got a feel-good theology. Most of you are aware of that. But that's what you're driving for in that question. Okay. Now we're going to ask ourselves a question back in your small groups. Get a pen and paper out and write these down. Psalm 103, 11 to 14. That's Psalm 103, 11, verses 11 to 14. 1 Peter 2 20 and 21. First Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Next, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Next, Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3. Exodus 20, verse 5. Exodus 20, verse 5. And then Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. Okay, go to your small groups. Here's your question. Which of those are a cat going to read and which are a cat not going to read? What are they going to reject? Go to your small groups. Okay, Psalm 103, 11 to 14, cats love. They're going to read that. It talks about how much God loves them. 1 Peter 2, 20, 21, he's been, we've been called to suffer. Cats are going to say, that's not me. Uh-uh. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, cats are going to say, that's not me. I'm not going to suffer. Psalm 40, oh yes, he lifted me out of the slime, uh, put me on a rock, yes, they love that. Exodus 20, verse 5, God's a jealous God, nope, don't want that. And then Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13, I know the plans I have for you, yes, a cat loves that. So half of them a cat's going to read, half of them a cat are going to reject. All right, now I'm going to tell you in our, in our next small group discussion question, I'm going to tell you about three people. And in these three people, I want you to be always asking yourself the question, what should we learn from this? Which life was God fair to? And from that, what do we learn about the fairness of God? One of the things that we teach is about the fairness of God. We want you to discover it in your small group. So I'm going to talk about three lives. The first life is uh, the life of Jabez. In 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10, Jabez is a man who went to God and said, God, I want the moon. And you can read the passage if you want, but he basically said, I want to be blessed by you. I want lots of property. I want zero pain. I want zero harm. I don't want the devil to touch me. And what did God do? God gave this guy everything. It sounds like a very catish prayer. I want you to bless me and give me all these things. But God answered and said, yeah, I'll give it to you. Boom. Right there, Jabez, the prayer of Jabez, God gave him everything. 
And so uh, health and wealth people love that book. You know, if the prayer of Jabez by Bruce Wilkinson, which actually was written by a dog, read by cats. Uh, but they just, oh yeah, God just wants to bless you. Trust him like Jabez. Okay, so that's the first one. Second life is a small little girl. <clears throat> her, her story is in 1 Kings chapter 5. And in the story, she and her people get taken off uh, uh, into war. And in the war, they, get, they lose, they're defeated. And so this other group of people defeated the Israelites. And as they were defeated, uh, they take back this little girl as a slave and she is a slave to the, to the wife of the second in command of the enemy's army. So you've got a second in command of the enemy's army. So you've got, a, you've got the king and then you've got the general. The general has a wife and that wife uh, takes a Hebrew girl as a slave. Now keep in mind, probably the context is that her family was killed, her brothers, her fathers, her mother was either killed or raped. She was probably raped and then she was sent off to be a slave. Now here's a young girl, probably 12, 13, 14 years of age, who's a slave, and the general gets leprosy. Hmm. He gets leprosy. And then the lung slave girl says, you know what, you ought to check out our prophet. I bet you he would heal you. And he, he says, okay, I'll go check him out, see what happens. He goes to the prophet of Israel, checks it out. He ends up getting healed. And then the second in command of Armony says, there is no God like the God of Israel. Life number two, a young girl taken captive through war under a Gentile and she touches a Gentile life for the glory of God. She does it as a slave. All right, what's life number three? Life number three is the story of Stephen. You all know the story of Stephen. He's a man full of God's power and grace. And as he's full of God's power and grace, he is doing miraculous signs and wonders. The Sanhedrin don't like him. They get people to lie about him. As they lie about him, they bring him before to yes to testify. They don't like his testimony. They stone him, and he literally dies being stoned to death. This man, full of God's power and grace, and was stoned to death. Hmm. Here's your small group question. Which life was God fair to? And what do we learn from that? Go to your small groups. Okay, they're going to wrestle with this one. But in this one, you're going to say, the answer is, what do we learn? God wasn't really fair to any of them. It wasn't, the question is not which life is God fair to, is which life brought him glory. And when you take that switch, every one of their lives brought him glory. Jabez asked him for the world, God gave it to him, that brought God great glory. A young girl, Second, in 2 Second Kings chapter 5, uh, and she gets taken captive through war, and she ends up reaching out to a Gentile leader, the second in command of the army, and he comes into the Lord. That brought God tremendous glory in light of all of her pain and suffering. Stephen, stoned to death for his testimony, that brought God tremendous glory. And so here's, here's the goal that we want them to learn. Life, <clears throat> excuse me, life was never designed to be fair. Life was never designed to be fair. Life was designed to be a series of opportunities to point to, to radiate, and to reflect God's glory. To point to, to radiate, and to reflect God's glory. That's what you want to teach them. Another option that you can do in breaking them down into small groups is to say this. Hey, listen. Now that you, uh, well, let's go through it. Now, actually, well, uh, you can either do this. You can say another small group question. Okay, what have you expected? Where have you expected life to be fair? And now, how can you see that as a way of bringing God tremendous glory? Break them down into small groups. You can ask them that. You guys, re re remember, you've got tremendous flexibility with these small groups. You can not use none of these questions I'm asking and make up all your own groups. When I was with the Maasai pastors, I totally switched it. For the pastors, I said, what's a cat pastor look like? What's a dog pastor look like? And then I said, suppose your young, unmarried daughter comes home pregnant. How's a dog going to react? How's a cat going to react? And then I said, okay, let's say that the Maasai culture goes in this direction, but the glory of God goes in that direction. Which one are you going to use? And so they love that one because they were us. So you just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Bring up any conclusion or any question that you want, use a part of the culture. Hey, with this culture, which, you know, which glorifies God? What's a cat going to do? What's a dog going to do? Okay.
Let's go through another question. How a cat and dog are going to respond. Let's say you're going through life, you're in your 30s, your 40s, somewhere in there. You've got uh, two small kids, maybe an 8-year-old and a 12-year-old. Your job's going well for you. You're getting good money. You're getting to save money. You've got a good apartment. Everything seems to be going your way. And all of a sudden, you get cancer. How's a cat going to respond? How's a dog going to respond? Go to your small groups. Boom. They go to it. And they work through it. What are the answers that we want? <clears throat> the answer, a, a, a cat is going to yell, God, that's not fair. I've given you my life. I serve you in church. I do all these things. And now you give me cancer. Whose side are you on? And they can get angry with God, bitter with God, resentful toward God. That's a cat. A dog says, okay, God, not really what I was thinking, but uh, if this is what it's going to happen, I'm going to bring you glory through the cancer that you've given me. I'll ask you for healing, but if you don't heal and you take me home, that's fine. Take care of my wife. Take care of my kids. Use this glory for your cancer. And that's something I had to do many years ago when I got cancer, uh, and I had to walk through that for the glory of God. Okay, to help you to keep understanding about cats and dogs, we want you to know that cats always want to relate to the winner. They never want to relate to the loser. In other words, when cats read the Bible, they look at the Bible and they say, okay, who's the main character here? That's the person I'm going to relate to, relate to because that person comes out winning in the end. And so, okay, all of a sudden, cats relate to the winner. Cats always want to relate to the major character of the Bible. They never want to relate to the minor character of the Bible. And therefore, there are tons of lessons that they could learn that they never do learn. What do I mean by this? Well, I want you to look at one book of the Bible. We're going to just take it, not going to look at any verse, but the big book of Job. What do we learn from the book of Job? Well, if you go through Sunday school, most Sunday schools, the lesson we learn from Job is that God may test you. Hmm. God may test you. Okay. Uh, I get that. Uh, yeah, God, you know, he, 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 his children died. He lost all of his cattle. Uh, and wait, I thought life was supposed to be soft, easy, safe, and comfortable, says a cat Christian. Well, basically for Job it was in the end. Yes, he lost his, all of his animals, and yes, he lost his kids. But God doubled the number of animals, and he gave him back the same amount of children, which, as it means, he basically had a really nice life with one major speed bump in the middle. So Job had a pretty good life, but Job is the major character in the Bible, and he has to learn to trust in God. Okay, we got that part. We're going to learn to trust in God, and we hope that God doubles all of our possessions. Got it, got it, says a cat. That's the major character. Who are the other characters in the Bible? And they'll say, uh, his wife, his family, and his children. Right. Hey, here's what you're going to do. I want you to go to your small groups, and I want you to discuss the question, what do you think the children learned once they got to heaven about what their lives were about? What did the children learn? When they got to heaven, they certainly had a conversation with God. Hey, God, why'd you kill us all at the same time? What do you think God said, and what can we learn from that? Go to your small groups. Okay, hopefully they're going to get this one. I've never done that one before. But uh, the answer we want them to get is uh, the fact that God took Job's children home early to teach their father a lesson. There are times when God allows us to be sacrificed so someone else can learn a lesson. God didn't love Job's kids any less. Their role in revealing God's glory was different, yet it was just as valuable. And so that's what you want to learn. God has equal love for all of us. God loves all of us equally, but our role in revealing his glory is sometimes very different. So that's the lesson that we want to learn from that one. Okay, now we go to the conclusion. And in the conclusion, we're going back to the one degree off. Is our Christianity one degree off? Would you say it's one degree off, five degrees off, 10 degrees off, 15 degrees off? What do you think? Maybe throw that out, see what the answer and said, okay, we're now at the very end of our time, uh, and so I want, I want you to just share one thing that impacted you today. One thing that impacted you, that really spoke to you, and I just want to ask a few questions, and then boom, ask them questions, and then just say, okay, thanks, we're done. Some people answer, some people don't, some people volunteer, sometimes I point people out, I just give them the microphone, what do you have, what did you, you learn? 
and then go from there. But that's your second lecture series of the cat and dog. You're going over the glory of God, and then you're going over uh, feel-good theology, and you're going over winner's circle theology. That's all in the book. Uh, so get that, read it, and look it up. All right. Thanks.